Hmm, Alexander doesn't remember that sign being on the wall before. He decides to take a closer look. It's a proclamation. It reads, Citizens Rejoice, announcing the royal wedding and coronation of Wazir Abdul al Hazred and Princess Kasima. For reasons of security, the wedding will not be open to the public. Long live the new king and queen of the land of the Green Isles. Alexander feels his stomach turn at the thought of the dread event. If he doesn't do something soon, Kasima will be another man's wife. Hello, I will be right up. Now, what can I do for you? How fare you, merchant? Sufficiently well, thank you, Alexander. My only wish is for more time to read. The bookshop owner might misinterpret that gesture. Beast's mirror consists of a piece of glass set into a decorative frame. The glass is unusually clear, and the image particularly true. Alexander examines Beast's mirror. The glass has a startling clarity, and the frame is quite beautiful. Alexander looks in the mirror and sees a handsome, somewhat lonely young man. The reflection in Beast's mirror shows an honest, myopic shopkeeper. I found this rare book, and I thought of your offer. Very interesting. Oh, it is a wonderful riddle book. Riddles are much more marketable than spells these days. I guess people believe more in mirth than in magic. Here is the spell book you wanted, and a fair trade it is, I must say. Enjoy it. I certainly hope so. We shall see how rusty my spellcasting truly is. Alexander is carrying a book from the bookshop. The cover says, Ye Old Spell Book. Alexander carefully reads the instructions for a spell entitled Magic Paint Spell. Speaking the incantation would do little good unless there were a painted object nearby to enchant. Alexander reads with interest the specifications for the Make Rain Spell. This spell must be cast over a teapot containing salt water, sacred water, and falling water. Alexander browses the details of a spell that claims to be able to charm a creature of the night. This spell must be cast over a skull containing hot embers, a strand of hair, and brimstone sulfur. This is the last page. Good day, Prince Alexander. Would you be interested in this mirror, merchant? I am afraid I have too many mirrors unsold already. People are not very interested in vanity during these troubled days. Sorry. Alexander decides to show the mirror to the old man in the cloak. Yikes! Zounds! That citizen obviously didn't like what he just saw. Too bad Alexander didn't get to see what was reflected in that mirror. The scythe has a long curved blade and a wooden handle. 
The scythe feels heavy in Alexander's hands. Alexander doesn't want to use the scythe on himself. He's not that depressed. Would you be interested in making a trade for this merchant? Oh, no, thank you. Big knives always make me nervous. Beauty's old clothes are very ragged and heavy. They consist of a long, thick dress and a headpiece which covers the hair and most of the face. Alexander searches through Beauty's clothes, but finds nothing. Alexander has no need to wear the serving clothes here. Would you be interested in trading for these women's clothes? Never carried garments, Prince Alex. Sorry. Alexander holds out the love poem, hoping that the bird will deliver it to the same place she took the ring, in the chance that the receiver might truly be Cosima. The nightingale swoops down, grabs the love poem, and takes it towards the castle. Sing, sing, my sweet. You bring another present. Let me see. It is a poem, Sing Sing. What was it when I looked at you? What power has chained me through and through and binds my heart with links so tight I cannot live without the sight of you? Oh, Alexander. I was hoping he'd return to you. Take this to him while he waits. Hurry, my fleet one. The little bird makes a delivery. The nightingale has dropped a bit of paper on the ground. It's a note. Dearest Alexander, I cannot believe you are here, my friend. Please, please be careful. Abdul isn't about to let anyone interfere with his plans. Watch out for Abdul's genie, Alexander, and do not do anything rash. I am not without resources, and I will prevail if I can only find some small means of defense. Do nothing to try to get to me. You must not be endangered again for my sake. Greatly in your family's debt, Cosima. Alexander's hand trembles as he reads the note. For the first time in his long search, he has heard her voice again, if only in writing. No words of love, only friendly concern friend. Is the maiden merely shy, or does she regard him only as a brother? Alexander is carrying a message from his beloved Cosima. Alexander holds out the rose, hoping that the bird will deliver it to Cosima. The nightingale takes the rose and heads for the castle once more. A white rose, how beautiful! It must be from Alexander. How I wish that I could see him with my own eyes, but Abdul will never allow it. He only risks capture by sending me these things, dear to my heart though they are. Fly elsewhere, my pretty friend. Do not endanger Prince Alexander again by taking tokens from his hand. Forgive me, Alexander, and forget me. I cannot return your love for fear that I shall never leave this castle again.
Alexander waits in vain for Cosima's nightingale to return, but the bird does not. Could there be something wrong? Or does Cosima simply not welcome his attentions further? Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. There's a small bottle on the coffee table. It bears a label that reads, Drink Me. The bottle doesn't answer Alexander. Alexander picks up the bottle. The little bottle contains some sort of potion and bears a label saying, Drink Me. That's rather forward of it. Alexander searches the bottle for a clue about the potion inside, but remains unilluminated. Alexander decides to swallow the potion in the bottle labeled Drink Me to see what happens. Suddenly, his vision fades to black. His lungs become too heavy to breathe. His heartbeat slows. Then, beats no more. Suddenly, his heart takes a lurch, then beats strong. His chest heaves like that of a newborn. His vision clears, and Alexander feels fine. Phew. For a minute there, I thought, what if someone else had seen me and thought, sounds? The glass bottle is full of milk. How strange for a plant to produce not only milk, but a container to go with it. The milk bottle is still cool from the damp air of the swamp where Alexander collected it. Alexander gives one of the baby's tears a bottle of milk. The other baby's tears seem to resent Alexander's gift for some reason. What a grip! The baby is not at all willing to let go of that milk bottle. Alexander collects some of the baby's tears in the old hunter's lamp. Highness may as well spend her royal time contemplating something else. The lump of coal shall be sent to the castle of the crown under my name, and that's all there is to it. No, it shan't. Yes, it shall. If the coal is sent in your name, I shall royally decree a ban on all red on this isle. You do, and I shall royally decree that white shall be henceforth used for all mopping up of cabbage stew. You wouldn't dare! Oh, wouldn't I? Oh, it's you 
Have you thought of any more of those brilliant ideas of yours? It would be noble of you to give the coal to the White Queen, since she desires it so much. Don't be silly. She desires the moon as well. I suppose that should be given to her as well. Perhaps you should allow your sister queen the coal and be content with the spoiled egg. Oh, perhaps you should keep your opinions to yourself. Alexander has a pitch black lump of coal that he found in the Isle of the Mists. Alexander doesn't want to get his hands dirty by playing with that coal. The Red Queen already has a lump of coal and won't share it with her sister. If Alexander gave her another, the two would never stop fighting. I found the two of you another lump of coal so that you can stop fighting over the one you have. Oh, let me see! A lump of coal! And what a beauty it is too! Oh, marvelous! Now we can stop fighting, sister. Your Highness can just keep the old lump of coal, and I'll take this new one. Quite right. That settles everything. As a token of our endless esteem and royal favor, please accept this magnificent and truly incredible spoiled egg. Uh... 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 Thanks. Let me see that lump of coal, Your Highness. It is a beauty, isn't it? Why, it's bigger than my lump of coal. Let me have it immediately. Over my dead body, Your Highness, it's my lump of coal. And it is indeed larger and much grander. Just look at that sheen. I demand you exchange with me immediately. Those grapes look awfully sour. Alexander addresses the grapes. Why are you so sour, if you don't mind my asking? Well, we'll tell you. How would you like to have the possibility of being made into wine hanging over your head? And then, there's our neighbors, the clinging vines. All they do all day is whine about the Ivy League social climbers that never call. It's really just no fun at all. Hmm, that's too bad. Well, I hope things start looking up. Thanks a lot. Alexander gets closer to the sour grapes. Back off, bucko! Oh, uh, excuse me. A delicate china teacup is occupying the chair at the moment. Alexander takes the teacup. The swamp lies just off the path. It doesn't look like very good swimming. The little china teacup is made of fine porcelain. The teacup is empty. The teacup feels delicate and fragile. What would a dogwood tree do with that? What do you think you're doing? You startled me. I was just getting some swamp ooze. Well, you certainly won't get it there! That's not swamp ooze! That's swamp muck! He's right, you know. But he could be a little nicer about telling you. He's not a very pleasant stick in the mud. Nobody asked you! Be quiet! <gasps> Oh, oh, 
the trials of being a mere bump on a log. <laughs> Swamp Ooze? That Swamp Muck? <gasps> it's true. He's right. Extremely irritating, but right. Shut up! Shut up! You worthless bump on a log! Oh, the cross that I must bear. Would that I could but avenge this uncalled for abuse. <laughs> Swamp ooze! That swamp slime! Oh, you really won't make any progress that way. He'll hog that swamp ooze of his. You'll never see a bit of it, no. I'll show you a bit of it! I'll knock your head off with it if you don't stop yapping! You see how he is? Alexander already knows that's not swamp ooze. Stick in the mud glares crankily at his brother bump on a log. Perhaps you could toss me some swamp ooze, since you seem to be able to recognize it. I can only reach this bit by the path. Well, hoity toity, look who's Mr. Wants so much! You think I got a job here passing around precious swamp matter? You should be so lucky! He's an utter waste of oxygen. I'd save my breath if I were you. But really, I... Never! I got your swamp ooze right next to me, and that's where it's gonna stay! This swamp ooze is mine! Period. Alexander isn't getting anywhere by talking to that cranky stick in the mud. The creature simply refuses to toss Alexander any swamp ooze. Alexander can't reach the cranky stick in the mud. Bump on a log is glaring angrily at his brother stick in the mud. Who are you? I'm Bump on a log, and that's my brother stick in the mud. We've had this thing about each other ever since our childhood. Mom always liked me best. She did not! That is absolutely not true! He's a bit lazy, you see. He's got the only swamp ooze in the swamp right next to him. But do you think he'd move a finger to help you get some? Hardly. He'd try to brain you with it more than likely. His temper's about the only thing that ever gets a workout. And that on yours truly. Oh! Like you've moved at all in the last century! Like you're Mr. Physical Activity! <laughs> Just because I can't reach anything, he thinks he can throw gushy swamp matter at me and just say whatever he likes. If only I could turn the tables on that heckler, he might learn some respect. But as you can see, I'm a mere bump on a log and must be content with my lot. Oh, shut up! You couldn't hit the broadside of a barn even if you had something to throw! Just shut up! You see how he is? Is there anything I can do to make peace between you two? You are brothers, after all. He needs a good thrashing, I expect. Huh? However, since you cannot go into the swamp, nor can I fight back, he will simply have to be born. Such is the life of a bump on a log. Is there anything I can do for you, Bump on a Log? Oh, there's no changing my lot in life. <laughs> a Bump on a Log is a defenseless creature, alas, and must put up with whatever cruelty fate dishes out. Bump and his log are too heavy for Alexander to carry. Besides, Bump on a Log is rather a homebody, the ultimate couch potato. Bump on a log can't help Alexander out with that teacup. It's his brother that has access to the ooze. If Alexander threw the teacup at Stick in the Mud, he'd probably never get it back. Stick doesn't seem too accommodating.
I thought this might come in handy the next time your brother starts picking on you. Aha! Finally! Old Bump on the Logs not so defenseless, is he? Hey! Hey! What are you doing there? Watch the pulp, would ya? Now, Bumpy! Remember all I've given you! The only thing you've ever given me is mud! Take this! No! Not into the swamp! Hey, okay! I give up! Jeez, sorry! Well, I guess it's not very pleasant having things thrown at you. I'm sorry. You mean it? Really? Brother? Brother? Stick in the mud and bump on a log, exhausted from the battle, immediately doze off into naps. Rotten Tomato, being equally lazy, decides to join them. <clears throat> Rotten Tomato seems to enjoy this smelly, mucky swamp. He's napping next to his new partner in crime, Stick in the Mud. How are you finding your new surroundings, Rotten... Uh, uh, Mr. Tomato? Can't you see I'm snoozing? All right, you're done good. Now, go play in the street or something. Yeah. Alexander is quite happy to be rid of Rotten Tomato, and has no desire to fetch him from the swamp. Stick in the Mud has gone into a delicious snooze. The cranky Stick in the Mud is sleeping now, and waking him up would be rather pointless. A glob of swamp ooze tossed during the brotherly fight has landed on the log. If Alexander tried to pick up the swamp ooze with his hands, it would only slip through his fingers. Alexander fills the teacup with the swamp ooze. Alexander doesn't need any more swamp ooze. The small vial contains the oracle's sacred water. The water has a crystalline appearance. Alexander examines the oracle's vial. It looks very fragile. Inside he can see crystal clear water. Alexander pours the contents of the oracle's vial into the hunter's lamp with the baby's tears. The vial, now empty of its sacred fluid, disintegrates. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. The fountain water might do for falling water, it's true. But the make rain spell calls for a teapot. That looks nothing like a teapot. Alexander fills the hunter's lamp to the brim with the fountain water. Alexander is carrying an old, battered hunter's lamp. 
The lamp contains sacred water, baby's tears, and fountain water. Alexander prepares to enchant the hunter's lamp with the Make Rain spell incantation. Clouds of thunder, shafts of light, come and sup with me tonight. Waters three have I for tea, brew a tempest now for me. The lamp in Alexander's hand gives a little perk. He hopes the spell works despite his makeshift teapot. Alexander is carrying an old, battered hunter's lamp. The lamp contains what Alexander hopes is the completed Make Rain spell. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Great gods, did you see that? The man just appeared from nowhere. Perhaps he was sent by the spirits. I see no boat. He is an intruder, no matter how he got here. Grab him! Not again. Look, I'll leave. It's no problem. I think not. Let's go. Alexander is frozen at the spectacle before him. Robed figures are gathered around a bonfire. Some mystical ceremony is taking place. But as to its purpose, Alexander has no clue. We found a trespasser on the beach, Archdruid. Uh-oh. Archdruid. Now what has Alexander wandered into? This must be the foreigner we were warned about. How appropriate that he should come during our rain festival. Place him in the sacrificial cage. Wait! I must rescue the princess! There's an ancient druid saying, a man who would save others must first save himself. Alexander is pushed into the confining wicker cage. And the cage is swung out over the bonfire. Alexander starts to feel a little warm. The bottom of the cage is getting uncomfortably hot. This cage is really hot. Fire in the cage! Alexander pulls out Beauty's old slave clothes, desperate to beat out the flames. The flame is extinguished, but the clothes themselves burn to cinders. Alexander won't be able to keep the cage from igniting for long. Heat and movement must have jarred something. Something that Alexander's carrying is starting to jiggle around. He gad, something's really percolating. The water in Alexander's lamp is hot. It's just about boiling. Alexander feels a drop. It starts to rain. That man is a powerful nature wizard. By the sacred oak, let him down! Must apologize for our rude welcoming committee. We've been feeling inhospitable ever since the winged ones stole our sacred miniature oak tree. Besides, Wizir Al Hazred sent a message that we were to watch out for a highly dangerous foreign assassin. 
I assume you are the one he meant. I'm sure I'm precisely who he meant. I assure you, I mean to harm no one. Unless that person threatens the princess. I'm sorry to have disrupted your ceremony, but I'm running out of time. What is it that you seek? The Oracle on the Isle of the Sacred Mountain told me I should speak to you about the Realm of the Dead. She told me of two souls in unrest there that I might be able to free. Free souls in the Realm of the Dead? You're mad! The souls might be able to help me on my mission to save the princess. It's imperative that I do everything I can. The risks are not important. No. And yet getting yourself killed will hardly help the princess. But I will tell you what I know. Legend has it that it is the right of any human to challenge the Lord of the Dead in order to save his own life or the life of another already passed. But the knowledge of how to do this was lost centuries ago. I have only heard of one who tried it. A young knight who came to the land of the Green Isles from a distant land long ago. According to the story, he was determined to challenge the Lord of the Dead for the soul of his dead lover. It is said that he tamed the Lord of the Dead's horse, a black-winged, demon-hearted beast named Nightmare. Nightmare sometimes flies to the human world to feed on certain noxious plants. Those unfortunate enough to see her are glad to escape with their very souls intact. Somehow, the knight captured Nightmare and rode off on her back, supposedly to the realm of the dead. But neither the knight nor his lover ever returned. If there was a means for challenge, it was lost with the knight. I see. Can you tell me anything about the Lord of the Dead? Ah, that is a blacker matter still. To the Druids, he is Samhain, Lord of coldness and despair. Samhain was once a man like you or I, but he insulted the gods and was sentenced to rule the underworld. Immortal he is and mateless. Robbed of sleep, robbed of movement, robbed of companionship. It is said that he hates all mortals even more for the mortality that he lost. That is all I know. Interesting. I shall remember. Now look how the oak embers of our bonfire still glow hot despite the rain. If you're bent on your course, You'll need courage that's just as impervious to the chill. <sighs> May your luck last longer than your storm, brave one. May it indeed. Thank you, Archdruid. Alexander is standing in the Druid's circle of giant stones. The rain festival has ended, and the druids have returned to their village to sleep. The bonfire still smolders in the center of the circle. The druids have left, and there's no one here to talk to. Alexander is standing in a circle of giant stones. He marvels at the complex yet simple design of the standing monoliths. The stone sentinels do not reply. The giant stones are smooth and cold and still damp from the rain. A gnarled old tree stretches a wide branch out over the smoldering bonfire. The branches of the old tree are well out of Alexander's reach. The wicker cage that was to be Alexander's fiery coffin is now lying on the ground. Alexander is glad to be out of that cage. Alexander has no desire to talk to that wretched cage. Alexander wants nothing more to do with that wicker cage. The embers from the bonfire are still smoldering despite the rain. The smoldering bonfire embers do not reply. 
Alexander has already had enough close contact with that fire. Alexander is carrying a human skull. Alexander examines the skull and feels a sense of his own mortality. Two heads are better than one, but Alexander is already carrying the skull. Alexander scoops up some of the red-hot embers in the ancient human skull. The Druids, exhausted after the bonfire festivities, are asleep in their treehouses. Alexander doesn't need to disturb them. Alexander doesn't wish to disturb the sleeping Druids. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Alexander arrives at the top of the cliffs, somewhat winded after his long but uneventful climb. A mighty winged horse, the color of midnight, is feeding from the nightshade bush. The creature must be Nightmare, the one the druids spoke about. Calm down, girl. Nightmare ignores Alexander. Nightmare merely eyes the object in Alexander's hand with suspicion and goes back to eating the nightshade. The creature seems content with the nightshade and ignores Alexander's peppermint. Nightmare only shakes her head at the smell of the stinky flower. Why would Alexander want to use the spoiled egg on Nightmare? Alexander holds the skull out to Nightmare. Nightmare is unmoved by the skull, at least in its current state. The spoiled egg has a slightly yellowed shell that bulges in spots from the pressure of the gases inside. Alexander is careful in handling the spoiled egg. That shell looks ready to burst. Alexander cracks the spoiled egg and dumps it into the skull containing the embers. The spoiled egg hisses as it makes contact with the hot embers. Zounds the steam. Phew, the smell of sulfur. The strand of hair from the red ribbon is the color of midnight. Alexander puts the strand of hair into the skull containing the embers and the spoiled egg. Alexander is carrying a human skull filled with oak embers, a strand of hair and a spoiled egg. The embers are glowing hot. A foul, sulfurous smelling steam rises from the spoiled egg and embers mixture. This is the first page. Alexander solemnly speaks the incantation over the skull. Creature of night, to me succumb. Fire and brimstone leave thee numb. Purity bind thee like a chain to do whate'er I now ordain.
Nightmare flares her nostrils at the scent of the fire and brimstone. That's it! Come on! I need passage to your homeland, fiery one! Unable to resist the power of the enchanted smell, Nightmare approaches Alexander. Her eyes appear glassy and sightless. In her hypnotized state, she is unaware of the human so close to her flank, or of anything at all except that marvelous smell. Now ride! Nightmare deposits Alexander on a strange, cold world. And some of the inhabitants don't look too friendly. Alexander is standing on the surface of the realm of the dead. The barren, surreal landscape is cold and gray. Twisted shapes loom on the horizon. The surface is haunted by the ghoulish shapes of the undead and by the chained, tormented spirits of mortals unable to rest in peace. Alexander hesitates to break the mournful, heavy atmosphere by speaking aloud. The realm of the dead is too eerie to invite close inspection. Alexander wants to touch as little as possible. The ghoulish, animated bodies of the undead roam the haunted landscape. Who are you, poor undead creatures? I see. How interesting. Restless spirits are bound to the surface of the underworld. Chained by earthly cares, they are unable to go below. These two spirits wander together. The spirit of a beautiful and noble-looking woman floats silently alongside that of a desperate-looking man. Who are you, grieving spirits? I am Queen Ilaria of the Land of the Green Isles, and this beloved spirit is my husband, King Califam. We were murdered in our beds by our trusted wizier. Like a viper, he snuck in during the night and stabbed us in our sleep. Now my husband's soul is broken, and he will not speak. Then you are the ones I seek. Are you not the parents of Princess Cosima? Our daughter! Have you news of the princess? I know that she is alive and safely back in her kingdom after being rescued from Mordak. But I'm afraid I have not personally seen her. Alhazred is keeping her in her room in mourning for you. I am glad to hear of her return. But she will not be safe alone with that devil. Oh, that we could be there to protect her. Cosima, how I fail thee. My poor husband will never rest while our murder goes unavenged and our daughter is in danger. I came to take you back with me. Your people are still loyal to you. They need to know about the Wazir. Cosima needs you too. But this is the realm of the dead. We cannot leave it, nor for that matter can you. The only one who might be able to return us all to the land of the living is the Lord of the Dead. But he would never help us. He has no mercy. I might be able to convince him. I must try. Then take this. It is my ticket to the underworld. There you will find the Lord of the Dead. I cannot use the ticket as long as I'm chained here. And if we cannot be avenged, I will never be unchained. Thank you. Perhaps it will save us all. Be careful, young man. If you can ease my husband's torment and help our daughter, we will be most grateful. I will do my best. Goodbye, Queen Alaria. The Queen has already given Alexander her advice, and the King is too distressed to even notice Alexander's presence. Alexander wishes to comfort the tormented spirits, but they are beyond the warmth of human hands. The spirits that haunt the surface of the realm of the dead have no need for material possessions.
the surface of the realm of the dead feels even more oppressive here. A path leads to an ominous-looking skull that looms in the distance. The surface is haunted by the ghoulish shapes of the undead and by the chained, tormented spirits of mortals unable to rest in peace. The gloomy path narrows as it approaches a sinister-looking skull. The path beneath Alexander's feet feels strangely organic. He has no desire to get any closer to it than is absolutely necessary. The spirit of a woman hangs like a puff of smoke in the air. She is weeping and appears to be very distressed about something. Ali, where is my little boy? Ali! Alexander wishes to comfort the tormented spirit, but she is beyond the warmth of human hands. Why do you not rest, sad spirit? Rest? I cannot rest. My son is lost. Lost? You mean in this realm? No. His spirit is stuck in the land of the living, probably looking for me. But I cannot leave to go show him the way. My poor Ali. Is there anything I can do? Take this handkerchief. If you get back to the land of the living and find him, tell him that his mother is waiting for him here. By this kiss, he'll be able to find his way to the realm of the dead. I'll do my best to find him. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my Ali! A monstrous skull looms at the end of the twisted path. The passing spirits are all heading for it as though it were a magnet. It must be the entrance to the underworld. The skull at the end of the path pays no attention to Alexander. Alexander can do nothing with the skull from here. He'll need to get closer. The otherwise dark sky is faintly illuminated by a full moon. Alexander has the feeling that it is always nighttime in this realm. He cannot imagine the light of day touching anything in this dreary place. The luminous moon casts a glow over the strange dark landscape. The moon does not hear Alexander's voice. The moon is far beyond Alexander's mortal grasp. Alexander can't fly in his current fleshly state. Some natural instinct draws the spirits of the newly deceased to the realm of the dead. They all seem to be focused on the skull that looms in the distance. The passing spirits seem to be in a trance and don't respond to Alexander. The passing spirits are beyond Alexander's ability to grasp. The skeleton to the left of the path hands something to the spirits that approach the underworld entrance. Take it, please. Next. Alexander is standing at the entrance to the underworld. The entrance is a huge tendon-covered skull. The skull's mouth is the doorway to whatever lies below. Two solemn skeletons admit the spirits who seem to be drawn, trance-like, to enter the skull. Living skeletons are gathered around the entrance to the underworld. Nice bone structure. Thanks. Alexander doesn't want to touch those skeletons. Besides, those bones have already been picked clean. 
A uniformed skeleton stands guard at the entrance to the underworld. He takes something from the passing spirits and then waves them on into the underworld. I must see the Lord of the Dead. Please let me pass. Tickets only. The skeleton at the door seems quite determined. Alexander has the feeling that trying to physically force his way past the skeleton at the door is not a good idea. A strange skeleton with a long horse-like head and ceremonial armor stands at the base of the path to the underworld. He watches over new arrivals with a discerning eye, handing tickets to the spirits desiring admittance. A large bone key ring hangs from his waist. Might I get one of those tickets? The skeleton with the tickets must not approve of Alexander's less than ghostly looks. He refuses to give him a pass. The skeleton with the keys looks rather grave. Alexander doesn't want to touch him. A large key ring containing a skeleton key hangs from the waist of the skeleton to the left of the path. It's unlikely that the skeleton would allow Alexander to just take his key. Would you be willing to exchange this for a ticket? The skeleton must not like the looks of Alexander. He refuses to give him a ticket, even in exchange for something else. The ghostly ticket reads, Admit One. Alexander can see his hand right through the transparent ticket. Alexander can see his hand through the ghostly ticket. That skeleton has plenty of tickets and isn't interested in the one that Queen Alaria gave to Alexander. Alexander is carrying the mother ghost's translucent handkerchief. Touching the ghost handkerchief gives Alexander a strong mental impression of the mother ghost worriedly searching for her lost son. The transparent hanky may be fine for a ghost, but Alexander feels a little nervous about using it himself. The skeleton is unlikely to be interested in the mother ghost's problems. A group of large bones form an interesting arrangement to the right of the path. Two smaller bones are propped up on the ground near the larger group. The group of bones near the path does not respond to the sound of Alexander's voice. Alexander picks up the two bones on the ground. Now what do these bones remind him of? Ah, uh, yes. Now I remember. The skeletons are overcome with the musical call of the bones. They begin to jiggle, then to dance. Alexander finishes his tune, and the skeletons resume their posts. Despite their frolic, they don't seem any friendlier. A key made of bone has fallen from the skeleton's key ring, and now lies on the ground. Alexander picks up the skeleton key.
The skeleton key is made out of small bones. The skeleton key feels a bit bony. Ah, to unlock the mysteries of man. Alexander could return the bony key, but he might find it useful. Besides, the skeleton has plenty more bones where that came from. I have this key of bone. Will it get me into the underworld? Tickets only. I have a ticket. Oh, on. Next.